CS TIC TV, tu portal de tecnología e informática, al servicio de la sociedad y los negocios. Estuvimos presente en el evento Future at Heart, donde Everis presentó el cambio de marca, a NTT Data. CS TIC TV, da la bienvenida a la nueva marca en el Perú. A continuación veremos las imágenes del evento. Today, Everis, a global management and digital consulting organization with more than 30,000 people, that you trust, will change his name to Entity Data. As you know, since 2014, Everest has been part of the Entity Data Group, one of the top six IT professional service companies in the world, with over 130,000 professionals operating in more than 50 countries. The Entity Data Group has recognized and supported the great work carried out by Everest people over the past few years, and our unique company model. We are a very different company today than we were when we formed Everest back in 1996. So adopting the new name and brand identity is a logical next step in our growth strategy after becoming part of the Entity Data Group. We are a company that has been evolving and improving continuously, but always keeping our essence. As you know, we have built our company based on a unique and strong culture. And this is something that you as clients and partners value. We will remain committed to our DNA and values because these values and our way of doing things are the keys to our success. These are the key of being able to overachieve our clients' expectations. With the new brand, we are becoming ever more global. We will now be even better connected to Entity Data Global Network of Innovation Hubs around the world, have easier access to industry expertise and cutting-edge technology to create value, helping people and organizations to become better. So, more global, but keeping our local focus. We will continue supporting you, being close to you, understanding your needs, and helping you to evolve your business through technology. We are a talent-led organization, and our priority number one will remain to always create the right environment to attract, retain, and develop the best talent and people in the market. We know this is what really makes the difference. We are very happy that you have been able to join us to celebrate this very special day for Everest, now Entity Data. Thank you. Today we are honored to have an exceptional guest, Steve Bosniak. Hi Steve, nice to greet you. Thank you for joining us today at this very special moment for Entity Data Everest and for all of us. It's quite an honor to be with you, Fritz. Looking forward to your questions. Steve, I'm sure you have a lot to share with us. After all, you are an icon in the technology and entrepreneurship field and a father of one of the most admired companies in the world. As you know, as a leading consulting firm, our job is to understand new technologies and find business use cases that, um, that will make the difference for our clients. Um, and it is not just about delivering solutions uh, for the business. We, we, we have also a responsibility and it's about making a positive impact through tech on people and society. And uh, looking at a uh, big picture, I think the main challenge here is to ensure to have a human touch in this uh, massive uh, tech-driven economy. So Steve, do you think the current approach will really evolve to a more human technology? Whenever I consider the value of technology, it almost always comes down to how it relates to humans. Long ago, one of my reasons for developing a computer was among other people in a club that spoke about how um, you would, if you had a tool and you could use that tool, you could be creative to create the better world for yourself. We didn't see it back then as, oh, other people will create this better world for you and you'll just use what they created. But that's sort of, that's closer to what we have now. As Apple evolved, we got a reputation for ease of computing. That meant it kind of fit users, good user interfaces. When we brought out the Macintosh, the idea was 
it would be intuitive. You'd look at a screen with an idea of something you wanted to do, and you'd pick out answers from words and menus, and an icon of a paintbrush would paint. It was like that kind of intuitiveness. And um, a lot of this ph this philosophy in Apple came from a guy named Jeff Rask, and I think he's the real, the key person for why even to this day, computers are kind of friendly. But um, I started seeing Apple as in a battle in the world. Is technology more important than the human? What the difference is was explained by Jeff Raskin. You can build two different of the same sort of product and they have different connectors and different processors, but they do the same things. But you can make one of those totally easy to use, put a lot of work in the software of how it works, and then the user will understand it and gets to live like a human. Um, the first example of that that really got to me was when Apple had the Newton message pad. You could handwrite with your human muscles. You're in a human world and the machine understood me and I wanted machines to understand me for the rest of my life when I live the human way. Um, now we have personal assistants, you know, beginning with Siri. And that emphasizes the fact that we put the work into our products so you can kind of live as a human and get answers. I don't want to learn all the structure, tap here, tap there, tap there, and I do the type this and I tap here, tap. I learn how to do it and I do it real automatically and easily. No, I just want to have a thought in my head, speak it and get answers whenever I can. And that makes the human more important. We put the work into the technology. When it's done the other way, the human says, oh my gosh, I'm forced to learn all this technology stuff that doesn't make sense to me. And then I'm living in a technology world and the technology is more important, has a higher priority. And, um, and I'm, I still have to hope every single day of my life that we keep going in the human direction because uh, sometimes on the technology side, technology wins and we don't want that. Actually, uh, for your answer, I guess technology uh, must be intuitive and even empathic. Well, when you're using other people's technology, it should be intuitive. But then there's the other angle that I touched on, which is if you are creative, you can write software, you can create music, you can create movies. Um, that's also allowing you to do more in your life because you couldn't do it without this tool, the modern digital technology. So there's two different ways, but mainly things should be understandable and intuitive is the best word Apple ever had. It was back in the days of the Lisa and the Macintosh kind of followed on the Lisa's footsteps. But over time, I've seen even so many cases where Apple, you know, just became like everybody else. And now you're running apps, so it's the app makers. They can make a good app that is when it's so human. I talk to my friends and I say, this app is so human. It works the way a human would want to. It works like a friend, another human being in front of you, interacting with you. And not like technology that doesn't care, like robocallers and all that. Um, so that's a big thing in my life to this day. It's still a battle that we should always fight and we should try to hire people that come out of, um, especially sort of the humanistic places, universities, maybe like Carnegie Mellon, certain universities that emphasize the humanness that should be in products. And I absolutely, that's everyone around me will tell you that I just talk about a program, it's human or it isn't. It's so inhuman, it bothers me. So Steve, um, after COVID, what we perceive in the market is that uh, this pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation across the board. So it's not just about tech. There are also fast changing topics in corporate culture, organization, society. You know, e-commerce is booming, the new ways of remote working, the new organizational approaches. Um, and there are not new trends, but most of them have been around for years, but they have accelerated overnight dramatically. How do you think society and business will be affected by this digital acceleration over the next few years? How will technology affect companies and people's lives? You know, there's a trend that's been going on for decades now. The technology is like a tool, just like the wheel or the hammer, tools that allow us to do things we couldn't do without them. And that's the role of technology. Now, the digital technology world started back in the time of personal computers, and it really gave us tools that could let us do a little bit more. And eventually those tools became good enough to be creative. And eventually they became almost like close to another human being and interacting with you. Not really, not really like a human being, but um, every company in the world, no matter what they do, they might make, they might build um, furniture. 
but they have to rely on technology. They have a huge technology department. Get a degree in, uh, you know, software and technology, and there's every single company needs you now. That didn't happen instantly, but uh, that's how it is, and it's still going. And companies that get into the digital world find out a it's changing to have more capability. And so they need more of it. And they have to keep hiring departments that keep up to date with what's going on. Trouble is you kind of have to stay at a level that everybody else is using, or you become, you know, almost hugely, um, I don't know, competed against. You wind up low on the economic total po totem pole. And this is just a lesson we've learned to worry about. You know, look, they even talk about physical things like wars, like the next wars will be um, fought over technology, over the internet. And we're seeing examples of that, where so many of the hugest companies in the world get shut down with ransomware attacks and stealing some of the data of their customers. And that's become, you know, a more important part of life in this digital world um, to all of us. It's critical. And there are a lot of people actually still being uh, hurt by it. So we need to keep putting emphasis and emphasis into the people that know how to make the technology and use the technology and set it up in ways that are safer for us. Cybersecurity is critically important. So in any field, a continuous uh, learning culture and pragmatic innovation approach are key. This is an essential part of our DNA in every uh, entity data, where each of us think uh, every day, uh, what I'm going to do differently today to really make a difference. This is uh, uh, important because of success. Um, our success is strongly related to our ability to innovate. What was the key, um, Steve, in order to innovate and create amazing products that you did at Apple? From when I was very young, even eight years old, I was going to be an outstanding engineer, knowing how to make electronic devices of the old days and do the mathematics involved and design them and make them and repair them. And then I got into the digital world. And that's very different. It's not mathematical. It's long sequence of stuff and understanding how they'll put together and turn out the right results. Uh, sure, Steve. Uh, we would like to know how was the innovation process at Apple? How did you work and innovate to build uh, what it is today? You can be an engineer, a great engineer. And you know how given an assignment and end goal, how to get there. But then there's the inventor. And the inventor kind of comes up with end goals in their mind. Says, this is where I want to go. And has, and has the abilities. Usually it's a single person, has a lab of their own that they can run into and have a lot of skill sets and develop something, a prototype. Once you get up to a prototype, this new thing that didn't exist actually can be worked, actually can be done. It's not necessarily um, uh, you know, impossible like they said before. That's the inventor. So I grew up with the inventor spirit my whole life just to build projects to impress my friends. Did you always dream of being an inventor or did you just uh, be become one? I didn't say, I'm going to be an inventor. What's the course I should take to get there? I did not. I was inspired by certain stories of inventors like we all are in movies and things we hear in school. But um, I think everyone is, expired, is exposed to that. I was lucky to develop skills by actually having certain types of knowledge and being able to hook tons of parts together, hundreds of parts when I was 10 years old to get a ham radio license and build a transmitter and build a receiver. And these, these motivated me to keep going and uh, really led to me kind of coming up with ideas and saying, oh, I can do it. And I had some electronic friends when I were young. And one thing we did, we didn't have any parents telling us to do this, any parents involved. We just ran some wires down the fence across the street and we hooked up these little house to house intercoms so we'd be in control of each other. When you do things yourself and it's your own thinking, it motivates you to keep doing things like that and to see yourself as an inventor or a creator. Um, now, eventually I became a very unusual type of inventor even, which is, We had no books on what a computer was, but by stumbling onto a couple of journals by accident, I learned parts of it and I, oh, I love this digital world. I can add ones and zeros myself. And I built huge science fair projects that won a lot of money, a lot of uh, prizes. And then I, got, I accidentally found a manual for a computer. And I said, oh my gosh, this is what's inside of a computer. It didn't have its design. 
But then I remembered my elementary school science fair projects. I knew the digital logic, so I started making drawings on paper. And probably I never got that computer designed after months, but eventually I started getting manuals for all the computers. I would look at their architecture, and then I'd sit down and say, what of the current chips would be able to make this computer? I could never afford a chip not a single chip. And I would design computers over and over and over. And the innovation came into, I would start saying, how do I do a good job first, but how do I do a better job? And it was that better job part. And this wasn't for school. I wasn't judged, you're all done with the project. I'd go to bed sleeping. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I'd dream the solution, how to make it fewer parts. I would look, if, it, if this computer took 78 parts of my design, can I get it down to 75? And I'd wake up with clever ideas, I call them tricks, to use chips sometimes in two ways at once, or some ways in ways they weren't intended to be used. And that came to a type of excellence of always saying, whatever I'm working on, I can often think of a better way to do it than I started, and then I would do it first. And I got very clever at tricks and developing new tricks, project by project. Every project was its own, and I would study, get all the little criteria of that project and, and all of the, the keys of what features it had to have, and I'd implement it that way, and I got into using very few parts and the most inexpensive parts in my designs, which I could never build. In the end, that turned into an affordable, useful computer. Because actually, um, you very often mentioned that uh, you always were thinking about removing things, making it simple, and yes, uh, shape uh, Apple with the approach of uh, less is more. Is this a powerful driver for innovation, making it simple? Absolutely, and I was right along with Steve Jobs in the Apple days, and he saw that, but he had the same mentality, making it with fewer parts. In engineering, we call it efficiency. It's a number. You take your output as a number divided by your input as a number and that's your efficiency. You want the efficiency to be higher to get more out for less in. So it's not always using fewer parts but it's also what's the cost? How much do you get out for the cost is the most important thing. And uh, that turned out lucky. I didn't think it was going to be an important thing in my life to have that ability but boy, when I designed the computer it was built that way and everybody saw You can make a full, useful computer with that few of parts and cost. Yeah, that really changed the world. Right now in the audience, uh, Steve, there are many CEOs or C-levels of important companies listening to us. And uh, one of the biggest challenges we are all facing is about uh, how to create a, or evolve to a successful culture of innovation in our companies. Um, based on your experience, uh, where should we start? Okay, when they hire teams is the place they should start because a company will say, we need a certain new product in our line of thing. Actually, they're better to think of innovators are here and you might not know that they're doing things on their own. There could be a huge home run in the end. So you should have a disruption office to kind of look for those people and have a way to spin them off or start them little companies and own a percentage of it. Um, and, uh, you know, Google was trying to have people work on their own ideas for a percentage of their work time, and it didn't really work out. It didn't work out. Everybody, you know, you can't force somebody to say, here's some free time of your own. No, the, you got to spot the good ones, and managers can do that. And managers aren't often looking for it. You need to, first of all, design the product that's for your company, and how do you design it? Well, we need to hire people of this skill set, this type of programmer, this one that does this database language, and we'll need to hire all these different people out of the universities, and we we research, we interview them, we, we hire the team. Well, that's one thing that I learned is very wrong in life, because um, especially young people, my own children even, you ask them, do you like your job? Yeah, I love it, I love it. How are the people you work with? They're all great. But sometimes you ask them, they say, no, I hate my job, and, and uh, my, how, how about your, the people? My boss is so horrible. You don't like the people you're with. Now that's personalities. Some personality types mix well, and some don't. We even had at Hewlett Packard, people who had problems in that area got special training on it. And you should you know, think about if you could hire people that are maybe not as well educated, haven't done it in the class already, but they're builders, they'll find the way and find ones like Steve Jobs and I hadn't didn't even have a college degree, but find ones that will work well together, that will um, you know go out to movies together, like the same books, like the same products of the past, and why, and the features in them. And if they think alike, you get a lot more productivity in your group. Um, now the culture, you've mentioned culture, you're probably meant thinking of 
company culture. And company culture kind of arises sometimes from your start. We were lucky to have two young people starting a company, but so did Microsoft. And um, and they don't get recognized always that way in Facebook, you know. But that that becomes a part of your culture that you didn't have to have something, and you could still make something great out of it. And Steve Jobs and I were in our young twenties. We had no money, no bank accounts, no rich relatives. We had um, no business experience, and and I, Steve Jobs didn't have any technical experience. I did an education. I had the education. But you know what? Um, yeah, you don't often take all that into account. Um, you know, it's easy to over, it's easy to overlook what's going to make a working group. So, and the culture, but the culture of your company comes from early expertises. You worked on things. Now, Steve Jobs was the culture of Apple because he would go out, he didn't know technology. So he couldn't be the engineer. And he didn't even guide the engineers on other products well. But he got out there, he had to be something important. So he had to speak well about the ideas of what computers meant to person. It was no longer a computer with a microprocessor that operated at a certain speed with a certain technology. No, it was here's how it'll change your life. He understood lifestyle well, so he really hit it when it came to the iPod. That's something that people use. He knew how it would work. Steve, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, it was great to be together and listen to you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, it's been great to be with you today and to uh, help with the notification that Eferis has been renamed NTT Data. Muy buenas con todos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos en este momento tan importante para nosotros. El futuro empieza en nuestro corazón y nos invita a dar un salto hacia adelante. Este salto es hoy en día exponencial. La forma en la que hemos crecido de la mano de la marca Everis en el Perú ha sido impresionante y por eso estamos muy agradecidos. Hemos construido una compañía con una cultura diferencial y vamos a mantenernos fieles a nuestro ADN porque nuestros valores y principios han sido nuestra clave para el éxito. Para afrontar retos futuros como la difícil coyuntura mundial y para que podamos actuar como una sola compañía también tenemos que evolucionar constantemente en nuestra propuesta de valor, combinando nuestro profundo conocimiento de la industria, el negocio y la tecnología de vanguardia, para proporcionarles a ustedes, nuestros queridos clientes, resultados tangibles que se ajusten a sus necesidades. Con el cambio de marca a NTT Data, ahora tendremos otro nombre, pero mantendremos nuestra esencia, nuestro entusiasmo y las ganas de estar muy cerca de ustedes. Estamos seguros de que podremos repotenciar todo lo ya avanzado con el poderío tecnológico que posee NTT Data. La compañía de origen japonés y parte del grupo NTT es una multinacional que figura entre los 10 principales proveedores de servicios de TI y negocios a nivel mundial. Es la sexta compañía de IT con más cuota de mercado y una de las marcas de más rápido crecimiento. Cuenta con presencia en más de 50 mercados en todo el mundo y más de 140 mil empleados a nivel global. Formar parte de esta nueva etapa es una oportunidad para seguir marcando la diferencia con nuestros clientes en el mercado y con las personas que trabajamos. Nuestra propuesta de valor está en evolución continua, combinando el conocimiento de negocio sectorial e innovación tecnológica, incorporando nuevos activos y productos, desarrollando alianzas en el mercado y reforzando nuestra posición como asesor de confianza de nuestros clientes. Queremos ser más globales que nunca, pero estar tan cerca de nuestros clientes como siempre. Apostamos por la innovación para crear proyectos que impacten en la vida de las personas. Por eso, asumimos el desafío de llevar en alto la marca NTT Data. Esta nueva compañía nos permite estar más preparados que nunca para anticipar los desafíos del futuro, atendiendo las necesidades del presente y ser cada vez más innovadores y estar más comprometidos con la sociedad. Siguiendo la estrategia de alineamiento y unificación 
corporativa propuesta por NTT Data, todas las compañías del grupo serán definitivamente renombradas bajo la marca. Como resultado, NTT Data será una empresa global más simple y sólida, con más capacidades para hacer cosas increíbles para nuestros clientes, nuestra gente y nuestras comunidades. Muchas gracias a todos y bienvenido NTT Data. CSTIC TV, tu portal de tecnología e informática, al servicio de la sociedad y los negocios.